we are now going to start another section. This one with even more continuous random variables that often show up in applications and in various contexts. I mean, there I would say that every one of them are pretty important. There's a lot of random variables, just in case you were wondering. Like people have uh, created random variables for many different situations. Uh, some random variables are useful for describing. Uh, real-world phenomena that's what they're for other random variables are used for more of a statistical context where you're you've got some test statistic and you're describing its distribution uh, so there's there's a lot of them but in, you know we're just gonna talk about a few more uh, so uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is the Weibull distribution uh, this has a shape parameter alpha greater than zero and a scale parameter beta greater than zero which already makes it sound kind of like uh, the gamma distribution that we talked about before, which also had a shape and scale parameter. And in fact, the Vable and the gamma distributions are pretty similar. I mean, they are certainly not the same. They are not the same distribution. They are not the same random variables. Uh, they <clears throat> have certainly different properties. Uh, but at the same time, though, in modeling context, it's actually a good question whether some phenomena in question should be modeled using a Vable or a gamma. Uh, it, it, so that's actually something like these are often pretty similar to each other uh, in practice. Um, all right, so here is the PDF of a Vable distribution. So we have f of x alpha beta. Remember that this is the uh, shape parameter and this is the scale parameter. All right, and this is going to be, so our uh, PDF is gonna be alpha to the, uh, alpha divided by beta to the power alpha, x alpha, uh, ugh, x alpha minus one, uh, which is making it look a little bit like the gamma, but then we have the E, which, all right, it's even lo looking even more like a gamma, but it's x divided by beta to the power alpha. And this is if x is greater than or equal to zero, uh, it's going to be zero otherwise. All right, okay. Um, so the mean and variance in CDF of the Vable distribution are given below. All right, so here is going to be our mean. The expected value of this random variable x is going to be beta times uh, Sorry about that. All right, so beta times gamma, uh, one plus one over alpha. So that's the expected value. And the variance of x, I'm gonna wanna zoom in for this. So let's see. All right, so the variance of x is uh, beta squared. And then we've got uh, gamma one plus two over alpha uh, minus uh, we've got gamma one plus one over alpha uh, squared. All of that in parentheses. You can pretty much see in that variance formula that the shortcut formula that I described before, it's definitely being used there. You can basically see it being you can see it being used uh, and then we've got the cdf f of x uh, so f of x parameterized by alpha and beta this is going to be well okay uh, this is going to be zero if uh, x is less than zero naturally and otherwise it's gonna be one minus e to the power negative x over beta to the power alpha if x is greater than or equal to zero. And you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a, a percentile function. So a to p will be, let's see, well this thing, uh, these random variables are going to be at least zero so we'll say zero if uh, p is equal to zero. 
and these random variables are unbounded so we'll say infinity if p equals one again that's not a number but uh you but so but whatever fine it's not a number we'll just we'll we'll we'll, we'll do it anyway <laughs> and otherwise we have uh a to p no 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 why am i writing that again oh my button's still not working okay um and then we've got a beta times negative log uh, 1 minus p to the power 1 over alpha. All right. So there's our percentile function. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, it has, it, it looks pretty similar to the gamma function in many ways. Uh, or the gamma distribution. I, I can, I looking at this, I see similarities between the two, but they are not exactly the same. Uh, this has one nice feature that the gamma distribution didn't have, which is that the CDF, you don't have some weird looking uh, integral. You don't have some uh, uh, incomplete gamma function showing up. Uh, it's actually a very nice uh, formula that's um, more elementary. The uh, expected value and variance are not nearly as nice as they were in the gamma case. Uh, but whatever. Um, what, what I remember this random variable being used for uh, is uh, it's I've seen it used for modeling uh, hazard rates uh, so or or a notion of hazard like um, so let's take for example the exponential distribution which by the way uh, examine this very closely and you can see that the exponential distribution is a special case of a Weibull distribution as well it's a, so exponential is a special case of both gamma and Weibull and you can see that if you take your shape parameter to be one, you get an exponential random variable um, because their PDFs are essentially the same uh, and, and their CDFs too. So you're, you're going to get an exponential anyway. Um, I remember reading an article in a magazine called Significance, which is a statistician's magazine, and they were discussing there how you can use the Weibull to model what's known as hazard or a hazard fun or like um, time until failure. Uh, you can think of the exponential distribution as modeling time until failure. It's just that when some object fails, right, which failure it can be thought of as uh, time until failure can be thought of as time until an event happens. Okay. Um, uh, with the exponential distribution, what you're saying is that uh, if you if the pro if this uh, component hasn't failed by now that doesn't really tell you much about when it's going to fail in the future like the odds of it uh, failing um, like uh, five um, days from now is the same as it was uh, when you first got the component so the so the hazard rate hasn't really changed over time whereas the Weibull distribution allows for you to consider uh, different uh, methods of hazard, uh, methods of failure. Like for example, you ha could have an aging component where as time goes on, the likelihood of, of failure increases. And I think, and this paper e or article even mentioned something about what parameters uh, cause, uh, can be um, associated with that. I think, <clears throat> I think if you have um, uh, larger shape parameters, you have um, uh, you have a higher uh, you have basically this uh, aging factor, or potentially you could have a situation where uh, components tend to fail early, and uh, that means the hazard is more towards the beginning, and then after that, hazard has a tendency to decrease. Um, so you can model many different types of hazard. Um, Gamma is all the gamma distribution is also in a way able to model hazard, but it's going to view hazard very differently where a series of steps are going to happen before failure happens. That's how I would that's how I would see um, gamma understanding hazard. So that said, this one advantage of this uh, Weibull distribution is that it can it's it's rather expressive which you can tell by examining its PDF for different combinations of uh, alpha and beta. And uh, the gamma distribution does not have this level of expressiveness, I would say. Um, 
So, for instance, uh, let's. Uh, I I'm going to create some sketches of what PDFs of the variable distribution could look like. Here's x. Here's f of x. Uh, if alpha equals one, what we get is an exponential distribution. Okay, and uh, if we have, uh, say, <clears throat> uh, alpha equals two and beta equals two, uh, a sketch of what this would look like is something like this. It kind of looks like a gamma distribution. Uh, and if we were to, say, have alpha equals 10 and beta equals one, we have a very different looking shape where it it, it increases quite rapidly up to a point and then it has kind of this sharp drop and then kind of continues on. So uh, you can end up with a lot of different shapes for the PDF, which means it's a rather expressive uh, random variable. Here's uh, some R code creating some uh, plots of the density function, which I would suggest that you play around with um, just, just to get a sense of what you could possibly get with different uh, combinations of alpha and beta. So but this, by the way, is zero because this thing's uh, going to be from zero on. All right. So let's see some examples. Uh, ugh, this is some unfortunate typesetting. Uh, wind speed in meters per second at the side of a wind turbine is believed to follow a variable distribution with alpha equals two and beta equals eight. Compute the mean and median wind speed and the standard deviation of wind speed. All right, so we're gonna have to take advantage of as much of this space as we can. So uh, W, uh, I hope I have the whole thing there. All right, so W uh, is following a Vable distribution uh, with parameters uh, two and eight. All right, so let's compute the expected value of this random variable. So expected value of W is going to be, according to our formula, eight times the gamma function at one plus one half. So that's equal to eight times gamma at three halves. We don't know what it is. At, we don't know what the gamma function is at three halves, uh, but we can kind of reduce the argument in the gamma function and say this is eight. And then we've got uh, one half gamma one half. because that's one of the properties we have for the gamma function, which then reduces that to uh, four gamma one half. And uh, gamma at one half, well, actually we know what that is. That's going to be the square root of pi. So in the end we get, uh, we get that the expected value is going to be four times the square root of pi, which is approximately uh, 12.5 meters per second. Okay, let's compute now the variance. Ooh, this is going to be not so fun. Uh, the variance of W is going to be, all right, according to that formula, we've got 8 squared. Uh, and then we've got uh, inside gamma 1 plus uh, 2 over 2, which is 1 plus 1. And then minus uh, gamma at 1 plus 1 half. Uh, squared, which is going to be eight squared. So gamma at two is going to be one. And then we have minus gamma at uh, three halves squared. All right. Which is going to be uh, eight squared. And then uh, one minus, so we've basically established up here uh, before that uh, gamma of three halves is, is a square root of pi over two. So this will be pi over four. Okay, all right, and we'll just kind of leave it like that because now I want to compute the standard deviation of this random variable. So the standard deviation of W Take the square root of everything, and you're going to get 8 times the square root of 1 minus pi over 4. And I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so, uh, off the top of my head, um, what, what that would be as a decimal number, but whatever. 
Okay, uh, what else did they ask for? Or I asked for because I wrote these. Uh, the median. Yeah, so we want the median too. All right, we will compute the median. So the median is going to be the uh, 50th percentile, and that's going to be... Uh, so that's going to be, um, according to our formula, 8 times negative log of 1 minus 1 half uh, to the power 1 over alpha, which is 1 over 2. So uh, this is going to be, uh, after you do some work, 8 times the square root of log of 2. Yeah, and again, I have no idea what that's going to be. <laughs> All right, so um, the turbine will not turn if wind speed is below 2 meters per second. Compute the probability that this occurs. All right. So uh, the probability that the so all right. So the probability that the uh, turbine doesn't turn. So the event that the turbine doesn't turn it is the same as the event that the wind speed is uh, less than or equal to two. Uh, so 2 meters per second, which is going to be the CDF of the variable at 2 when its parameters are 2 and 8. All right, which is going to be 1 minus e to the power negative 2 over 8 squared, uh, which is equal to 1 minus e to the power negative 1 16th, uh, which is about... 0 0.06 so there's a six percent chance um, that this turbine doesn't turn on any given day all right so here's some r code we're working with the uh, pdf d label to understand the label distribution which is also spe specified by shape and scale parameters uh how how does that uh how does that mean correspond with what i uh suggested Oh, that's uh, not quite the same. That's unfortunate. I think I might have uh, miscalculated. Yeah, I, I mean, well, not, 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 not in the R code. The R code's fine. My guess was wrong. <laughs> so, oops. All right. Uh, the variance, I compute the variance and then compute the standard deviation by taking the square root of the variance. A lot of this stuff is stuff that you've uh, seen before. All right. Uh, X is said to follow a log normal distribution. Uh, so we're now moving on to the next distribution, which is the log normal distribution. So x follows a log normal distribution uh, denoted by x follow, uh, follows ln mu sigma if the natural log of x follows a normal distribution. Or ln of x follows a normal distribution with mean parameter mu and standard deviation sigma. If this is the case, then the PDF of x will be so. F of x uh, parameterized by mu and sigma is equal to um, one over the square root of two pi uh, sigma x. And then we have e to the power, uh, all this is gonna be in this power. So I'm gonna put a parenthesis around it. Negative ln of x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. Okay, so uh, to uh, maybe just kind of reinforce the relationship. Oh, uh, I should probably finish this and say that it's 0. Oh, so this is the case if x is greater than or equal to 0. It's 0 otherwise. All right, anyway. Uh, moving on. If we say that y follows a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then e to the power y follows a log normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma. That's a relationship between a normal and a log normal, and understanding that relationship is pretty important if you're going to work with these random variables. Okay, so uh, we can express, in fact, the CDF of this random variable x like so. Here is its CDF. Um, so... Uh, it's parameterized by mu and sigma. 
Uh, and this is going to be the probability that x is less than or equal to x, uh, because that's what CDF means. But this is going to be equal to, as well, the probability that ln of x is less than or equal to ln of little x. Which, since ln of x is following a normal distribution, so since this part follows a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, uh, we can then say that this is going to be the CDF of the standard normal curve evaluated at ln x minus mu divided by sigma. And this is going to be the case if uh, the our input x is greater than or equal to, well, okay, let's say strictly greater than just so that we don't have to worry about uh, taking the ln of zero. So if x is greater than zero, but it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, and naturally, if uh, x is less than or equal to zero, then we're going to say the CDF um, is going to be zero. Okay. Now, I wrote down mu and sigma, but this is one of those ca those cases where mu is not the mean and sigma is not the standard deviation of this random variable. They're the mean and the standard deviation of the natural log of this random variable. The mean and variant... Uh, the mean invariants of this random variable are going to be different. So we have instead that the expected value of x is equal to e to the power mu plus uh, sigma squared over 2. That's the mean of this random variable. Right. And uh, uh, the variance of x is going to be e to the power uh, 2 mu plus sigma squared. And all of that is going to be multiplied by e, e to the power sigma squared minus 1. Okay, that's the variance of x. So uh, this random variable also has a fairly interesting uh, C, uh, PDF in that it can look like many different things depending on the configuration of mu and sigma. For example, here is what this PDF could look like if uh, mu is equal to 1 and sigma is equal to 1. So this PDF would look kind of like so. Uh, so this is a right skewed distribution by the way generally. Um, uh, with the with the Vable distribution over a certain range, it actually has a it, it looks rather left skewed. Um, I should probably actually look at what its skew is. I think it's possible that um, I think yeah I think it, even though it extends over infinity, huh? Is it is it possible for a random variable that has support from zero to infinity? to be left skewed? Hmm, that's a good question. That's something that I should look into. Uh, but anyway, uh, continuing, to, continuing on with what we were talking about. Uh, another possible configuration, we can have uh, mu equals 3 and sigma equals the square root of 3. Then we get some something looking pretty different. Um, we get more of a line when, as it decreases uh, rather than the... Uh, rather than this uh, sharp change in concavity early on. Uh, or uh, in the case of mu equals 3 and sigma equals 1, it looks like in a region uh, the tail is actually rather heavy with, nearby. So, okay. All right. Um, so moving on. Uh, here's some R code for working with this thing. The uh, class of functions meant for working with log normals are L norm functions. And I'm giving it the mu and sigma parameters, and you can see some plots of it. All right, uh, so uh, the next example, the current price of the stock with ticker symbol CGM is uh, $26.18. The quants, so quants are um, uh, these, it's a Wall Street term for uh, let's say quantitative analysts, people who are 
using very mathematical approaches to understand the behavior of uh, of uh, securities. So the quants believe that the price of the stock in a year is y, which is equal to 26.18 times x, where x is a random variable that follows a log normal distribution with mu parameter 0.1 and sigma parameter 0.2. Based on this information, find l and u such that the probability that L is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to U equals 0.95, and the probability that Y is less than or equal to L is equal to 0 0.025. So basically, I want to find, what this says is that I have an equal-tailed um, uh, region where the likelihood of the stock either being too low or too high is, uh, is the same. And what I'm looking for are actually quantiles such that in a year, the probably the stock is within that range is 0.95. So I'm actually looking for like a prediction interval. I believe with some uh, level of confidence that the stock will be in this region in a year. That's basically what we're asking for. So uh, what is this going to be? Well, we can start out by saying that the natural log of x follows a normal distribution with mean 0 0.1 and and standard deviation 0 0.2 okay so hmm all right let's start out by saying uh, that the uh, probability that the stock is within two okay so ln of x minus uh, 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.2 that it's within uh, negative 2 and 2. So this is going to be about 0 0.95 by the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So so this random variable that I have in red, ln of x minus 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.2, that's going to be a standard normal random variable. Uh, so I'm asked, so I'm saying that the probability that a standard normal random variable is within plus or minus two or plus or minus two standard deviations is going to be about 0.95. And this is also equal to um, the probability after we try to isolate ln of x so that it's by itself. This will be the probability that negative 0.3 is less than or equal to ln of x. Uh, which is less than or equal to 0.5, and this is based. This is basically looking at uh, the probability that ln of x is in is within plus or minus uh, two standard deviations of its mean. All right. So um, this is also equal to the probability that uh, e to the power negative 0.3 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to e to the power 0.5. And then we multiply everything by 26.18. So we say this is, the, this is going to be uh, the probability that 26.18 e to the negative uh, 0.3 is less than or equal to 26.18 x, which is less than or equal to 26.18 uh, e to the power uh, 0.5. Okay, and then finally, recognizing that this part in the middle of the inequality, this part right here corresponds to y, which was the price of the stock. So we get to say that the probability uh, that the price of the stock is between after you also plug those other numbers into a calculator uh, 19.36 and 43.16 uh, this is going to be approximately uh, 0.95 okay where so that means that this lower number corresponds to our answer L and this upper number corresponds to our answer u. So those are going to be the lower and upper bound of our prediction of the stock. Okay, so actually some more terminology, uh, some more background on this problem. Uh, it is actually common enough, let's say, 
or classical in a, in a sense. A classical approach to modeling stock prices is to say that they're following some normal distribution. Now, it, it, we're, we're going deeper than that. But actually, no, not a normal distribution, a log normal distribution. So that means that in classical financial models, uh, such as the uh, very famous Black-Scholes model, stock prices are understood to follow a log normal distribution. Uh, the random variable X, uh, well, actually LN of X can be understood as the return of a stock in a year in this situation. So X itself is just how much the stock increases or decreases, in, increases or decreases, but as a multiplicative factor, right? So uh, 26.18 is just something we do to give the stock a starting price. So we're saying by how much, so X can be understood as the return of a stock um, in a year. Um, so, uh, and uh, this modeling of stocks as, following a log normal distribution it's it's uh common in these classical financial models it's also wrong so uh it so so before you go get too excited uh just be aware of that it is wrong uh so anyway we here's some r code that's doing similar work uh in this case i'm just directly asking for um this random variable X getting its uh, lower and upper quantiles to then get the lower and upper bound of the price of the stock, which you get after multiplying by 26.18. All right, uh, so our next random variable is a random variable following the beta distribution. So the beta distribution uh, is we, we've got in our book uh, a beta distribution with four parameters uh, alpha, beta, A, and B. So now that said, I'm actually very familiar with seeing beta distribution with just two parameters, alpha and beta, but it's implicitly assumed that in that situation, A is equal to zero and B equals one, because the beta distribution is a random, is the distribution for a random variable that uh, can possibly be between two numbers. So a lower bound and an upper bound we have two shape parameters in this case. Excuse me. Alpha and beta are both shape parameters. So they're changing the shape of the distribution, whereas A and B, those are lower and upper bounds. So the probability that a beta random variable is below A or above B is zero. So in that sense, A and B are both location and scale parameters. Um, and alpha and beta control the actual shape of the distribution. Okay. Um, so the PDF of this beta random variable is going to be F X parameterized by alpha and beta. A and B is going to be um, 1 over B minus A. And then we have, oh boy, I'm probably going to have to zoom in for this because the formula in general is rather complicated. Okay, we got 1 over B minus A. And then we got gamma alpha plus beta uh, divided by gamma alpha gamma beta. All right, and then we have X minus A over B minus A to the power alpha minus one. And then B minus X over B minus A to the power beta minus one. And this is going to be the case if A is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to B. And then this is zero otherwise. All right, I'm not going to bother trying to write down any sort of CDF for this um, because that's just going to be a pain and not going to really be all that enlightening. The good news, though, is that if you choose alpha and beta to be integers, then what you actually have, uh, 
then your uh, the you know the interesting variable here is x. If you choose alpha and beta to be integers, then this is going to be a polynomial. So you're actually integrating a polynomial over some bounded region, and that's 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 nice. You guys should be very familiar with integrating polynomials, right? Po integrating polynomials, it really doesn't get much in, uh, easier than that. Okay, so uh, if a is equal to zero and b equals one, we may say that x follows a standard beta distribution with its respective shape and scale uh, shape parameters. Um, so that's actually fairly common, but in general, when you're doing some sort of uh, modeling with this thing, unless you have some specific reason to restrict a and b to zero and one, uh, you you get something much more general by allowing for a general a and b. So the mean and variance of x are going to be uh, as follows. The expected value of a random variable x following this distribution will be a plus alpha times b minus a divided by alpha plus beta. Okay. And uh, let's see, the variance of x is going to be b minus a uh, squared times alpha beta divided by alpha plus beta squared uh, uh, times alpha plus beta plus one. I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, in the case, in the standard beta case, I'm going to rewrite down, uh, well, not I'm not rewriting it. I'm going to go ahead and write down the uh, PDF for a standard beta distribution with shape parameters alpha and beta. So we got alpha and beta, just because, honestly, this, this uh, PDF that I wrote up here looks pretty menacing. And if you go to the standard beta case, it's not as menacing. You still have gamma alpha plus beta divided by gamma alpha plus gamma beta. Which you may recognize as resembling some sort of generalized n choose k formula uh, since gamma is related to n factorial. But otherwise we have x alpha minus 1 uh, times 1 minus x to the power of beta minus 1. Uh, and this is going to be if 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 1. So it's a little less menacing if you're working with the standard beta. Okay, and then there's our expected value and variance. All right, so the beta distribution can assume a large number of shapes depending on its shape parameters. Uh, but it always has compact support, or meaning that um, it's uh, the region over which this uh, PDF is non-zero is um, is a uh, is this uh, bounded region? It's not going to extend over some large part of the real line, like extending to infinity or negative infinity or anything like that. Uh, so, some examples of some of uh, what PDFs of this could look like. We have uh, we could have a PDF that looks like this, and it does cut off at a certain point, right? So it doesn't go extend all the way to infinity. It will go straight to zero. Um, well, or at least this one is. We could also have this, a straight line. If it's a straight line, it's a uniform distribution. The beta distribution includes the uniform distribution. Uh, and you could see that by choosing your, uh, let's see, uh, you would choose alpha and beta to both be one. And you'll end up with a uniform distribution. So go ahead and play around with that and see that in fact, the uniform distribution is a special case of beta. And finally, another one that we could see, we could see a, uh, a distribution that looks like this. I think you're going to see something like this uh, if your alpha and beta are rational and they're less than one. I think that's when that shows up. So here's uh, some, an example of what a, curve, a density curve for a beta distribution could look like. All right, uh, an example. Suppose that x is following a beta distribution with parameters 3 and 2. Write down the PDF of x and compute the expected value of x, the variance of x, and the probability that 1 fourth is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 3 fourths. Okay. So let's first write down the PDF of this random variable. So f of x is going to be 
this is a standard beta distribution. So uh, I didn't write down two more numbers. So that means that A equals zero and B equals one implicitly. Okay. So we're going to have gamma of three plus two divided by gamma three, gamma two. And then we've got uh, x to the power three minus one. And then one minus x to the power two minus one. All right, let's uh, figure out gamma three plus two. Uh, gamma three plus two. Uh, so is going to be gamma five, which is four factorial. And the denominator we're going to have. Uh, so we are going to divide this by two factorial and one factorial. Uh, so we've got basically, basically four times three. So this is going to be twelve. Okay, so this is going to be uh, 12 times x squared times uh, 2 minus 1 is 1, so we'll have 1 minus x. So this is going to be 12 x squared minus x cubed. And this is uh, if 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 1. All right, uh, next let's compute the expected value. The expected value of x is going to be uh, 3 over 3 plus 2, which is going to be 3 fifths, which is equal to um, uh, 0 0.6. The variance of x is going to be uh, 3 plus 2. No, 3 times 2. My apologies. Uh, so, oh, darn it. Right, that's not a thing. So three times two over uh, three plus uh, three plus two squared times three plus two plus one. So we have six divided by six. So this will be uh, one over twenty-five. And then we need the probability that one fourth is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to three fourths. So for that, we can just directly integrate the C, the uh, PDF because we've got a lovely looking polynomial. So we've got one fourth to three fourths, and we've got and we're integrating x squared minus x cubed. Uh, also multiplied by twelve, but I just brought that outside of the integral, and that's going to be uh, twelve times. Uh, x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4, taking this from uh, 1 fourth to 3 fourths. And I'm going to leave evaluating that as an exercise to you, but in the end, you get 176 over 256. All right, not everything is going to be lovely. So here's the density curve of this random variable. Notice that it kind of has a I would, say, I would call this random variable negatively skewed. It's kind of uh, biased towards around 0.6, which by the way, like its mode appears to be its median. At least they appear to be very close to each other. Uh, here is the expected value, just integrating stuff, its variance and computing uh, the, uh, the probably that's within a certain region. All right, uh, next example. Uh, in a paper by Maltamo et al., uh, the basal diameter in centimeters of pine trees it was fitted to a beta distribution. The paper suggests that if B is the diameter of a pine tree, then we can model B with a beta distribution uh, with shape parameters 1.3 and 1.1 and, and uh, min lower bound 4 and upper bound 40.9. I would say that unless you're going to argue that there is a physical upper bound on the um, diameter of a tree, which seems... It seems not quite right to me, but also I am not an expert in this subject at all. So I know very little about that. So maybe they could say that um, there is some physical upper bound such that it is literally impossible to cross it. Um, but otherwise, I would say that this is just a, a distribution that seems to fit the data well. Right. Um, what then is the mean diameter of the pine trees and what is the standard deviation? Okay, so the mean diameter is going to be 4 plus, uh, using our, our formula, 1.3 
times 40.9 minus 4 divided by 1.3 plus 1.1. Okay, and this is going to, after you do a whole bunch of arithmetic, be equal to 23.9875. So that's its expected value. Its variance is going to be uh, 40.9 uh, minus 4 squared uh, times 1.3 times 1.1 divided by uh, 1.3 plus 1.1 squared times 1.3 times, uh, no, plus 1.1 plus 1. All right, take that, plug it into your calculator. You get, as your final answer, 99.42312. So that means that the standard deviation of B is going to be the square root of that number, 99.42312, which is approximately 9.97. Okay. So this is the... Uh, uh, resulting this is basically the curve that they have that they seem to feel uh, well describes the diameter of uh, pine trees and here is some uh, of those other calculations such as computing the mean and standard deviation okay so uh, that basically concludes our discussion for a lot of random variables actually in this course there are some other random variables that we would see such as the t distribution and the f distribution and those distributions are more for uh, specific random variables and describing how those... Well, okay, they're more for describing the behavior of uh, statistics, as in something that you're computing, rather than describing any sort of real-world phenomena. Uh, now, um, there's like a gazillion random variables, but the good news is that a lot of important facts about these random variables, such as what's their CDF, their PDF, uh, what is their mean and variance and so on, that's largely tabulated. That's, that work has already been done for you. You do not need to recompute those things yourself. So getting familiar with identifying random variables in problems and then applying formulas that are useful to them, that is a good skill to have, and that is a good skill to practice. Now, I made this table for when I was teaching Math 5010 last summer at the University of Utah. That is an introductory probability course. And uh, I made this table of uh, various random variables. This does not cover all the random variables that we talked about in this class, but it, it describes parameters for those random variables, interpretations of those random variables. Uh, their probability mass functions or probability density functions. Th do note that they are using a different, I am using a different notation here. I do not use that uh, piecewise function notation. Instead, I use indicator variables, which are going to be one if the input x is within the set that they are talking about and zero otherwise. So this is going to basically be one minus p if x is between zero and infinity and p, and this part will evaluate to p if x is between one and infinity. Um, so you would have to get somewhat familiar with the indicator notation to use uh, the CD, well, I guess any part of this, um, it, but to use this table, you need to get familiar with it, but you also get expected values, variances, this column corresponds to moment generating functions, which I will not be talking about at all in this class. Um, but yeah, this is a table. I may make it available uh, for this class, or you could, if if I haven't done that, uh, you can probably find it in my on my webpage for previous courses. Um, and you look up summer of 2019, Math 5010, and you'd find this table there. But that concludes. Uh, my discussion of uh, this uh, zoo of random variables. And uh, in section six, I'm going to talk about techniques uh, or a technique that we can use to decide whether a certain phenomena can be described by a certain random variable. Uh, this is known as a probability plot because a lot of these continuous random variables, you don't have these nice narratives like we did for the discrete random variables about when this random variable appears. Um, we don't really have that here. So what we can use instead to decide what is an appropriate distribution for a data set is a probability plot. This is one technique that we can use. So I'll be talking about that in the next video. 
And uh, until then, uh, have a good day.